What's up, everybody? It's your boy B. Scott with the Philadelphia Eagles. I just want to thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five-star rating. Fly, Eagles, fly. Tune in to Eagles Brawl of the Brawl Network. However, you're listening, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, or any other podcast platform. We greatly appreciate it. Looks like it's just going to be me today. Johnny, work's been picking up for him ever since uh, school's been back into session. And then Tyler, obviously, work's been picking up for him as well. He's doing a great job right now. Uh, it, it's tough. Like I, like we said in previous episodes, these guys, we all live on different coasts of the world. So it's hard to meet up and get everything down for an episode. So, uh, Johnny and I talked and we thought like, Hey, you know, we, we could record by ourselves, uh, voice our thoughts and opinions on things and just, you know, mesh it for an episode and throw it out. So everybody gets our feel on it. And I, I, there's some things going on with the Eagles that we had to finally make an episode and address, uh, the Brandon Brooks injury, the Jamal Adams trade rumors. It, it was just time for me to finally get behind the microphone and address these certain things so I can just get my opinion out there because I've done it on Twitter. Uh, I think a lot of people really uh, – people liked what I said about my Matt Pryor. And then some people were like, come on, like y- you can't think that he's actually going to be uh, a replacement for Brandon Brooks. So now I can finally just get behind the microphone and explain why I tweeted out those things and what my thinking is. Going into the season. So, let's just get right into it now and talk about the Brandon Brooks injury. I, I, the impact of his loss, to me, seems to be going on the really the underrated side. Because, again, you're looking at a guy who signed with the Eagles in 2016. Right when this Doug Peterson whole regime started. So, he really is one of the foundation pieces of this team. Of this offensive line. Ever since he signed with Philadelphia, he's only given up three sacks. Just three. Obviously, a top three offensive guard as he is well thought of around the league as being such. Uh, You can put him in the same exact tier as Quentin Nelson, Zach Martin, and, and himself, and nobody would argue. Very great in pass. Very great in run, too. Uh... Very better. He's a better blast pass blocker than he is a run blocker. But still, you just look at what the Eagles do with the right side of their offensive line, the strongest side of their unit to all together. Uh, they favored using Ra- Miles Sanders running on that side. Either it was inside zone or outside zone. They favored the right side. And, I mean, obviously you had Dillard in there for spurts during the season, Jason Peters on the back end of his career. And say Malu is an, an average starter. A left guard, a good but solid, average starter at left guard. That that's your weaker sign of the, the weaker side of the offensive line, and the Eagles just ran Miles Sanders majority to that side. Uh, I would argue we'll go look back at the Miles Sanders film this year, especially you talked to Johnny about it. They really favored using him on the right side. So that you, from a running standpoint, you take away that, and then you also take away the pass protection for Carson Wentz, who, as we all know, has durability issues. We get reminded time and time of that. That's going to be something tough for the Eagles to overcome. But as everybody likes to point out, they have ample amount of time to do so, which is great. But to me, look, it's it's as simple as this. Now, the whole – people want to say Jason Peters moved him to guard, and uh, I don't want to touch that subject for this episode because I do have Brandon Thorne of The Athletic, Established the Run, uh, Trench Warfare Podcast. He's coming on for the next episode. We're going to discuss – uh, the offensive line and Jason Peters and Brandon Brooks and all and Jason Kelsey and all that into extensive period then. But for now, I don't believe you can put Jason Peters at guard. I don't think you can ask a 38 year old NFL player who is still playing at a high level at left tackle to, Hey, kick inside a guard and play a position you never played before. I don't think it's that cut and dry as everybody wants to say it is. It wasn't cut and dry when you moved Diller to everyone. Wanted, like I, it's just funny to me because people th- think offensive tackle, you can just, 
move on either side and it's fine. It's not. It's a completely different position. You hear Lane Johnson say it a lot. Andre Dillard proved it to you against the Seahawks. Big V, really, you could use him. He's a swing offensive lineman. You could use him at guard. You can use him at tackle. He's not a serviceable starter, though. He's a death guy. So uh, the conception of that, I guess, is why people think you can move these guys all over. I don't think you can do it with players like Jason Pierce. I don't think you can do it with players like Andre Dillard. I don't think you do it with players like Lane Johnson. I, you can't just ask these guys to play different positions and expect them to play at a high level. I don't see it happening with Jason Peters. And especially since if you sign him, if you sign Jason Peters to come back, he's your best left tackle on the team. I'm not convinced Dillard's ready. They they are. Uh, it looks like they're going to go with Dillard to me. Because if they wanted Peters back, they, it would be done by now. I don't know what. I, I guess they're going to see what camp and see what everything looks like when they uh, finally had this training camp and see where Dillard's at in his progression. But obviously, you want the first round pick that you drafted to be that guy. I just don't. If you bring Jason Peters back on this team, he's automatically walks in the door as your best left tackle because Andre Dillard in year two after pandemic, after really we don't know how this training's gonna affect them, but it's gonna affect them some way. He's not gonna be at the best position to take this job and run with it. I have faith in him. I think he could turn it around because I think he struggled last year, but I think there were some bright spots like a lot of people like to point out. Yes. So I do believe in him. I think he is the future left tackle of this team. I don't just don't know about next year. So you bring Jason Peters back, he's your best left tackle. I don't agree with moving him to guard. I don't think that's the answer to replace Brandon Brooks. The only reason why I'm more on the Matt Pryor side is because I've seen them develop guys like Big V, who was the fifth-round pick nobody thought of much in that draft. And to a starter, now he's on a huge contract with the Detroit Lions, which I thought they completely overpaid for. And I don't think he is a starting offensive caliber lineman. I think he's a swing tackle. At best, that you can kick into guard. That's a guy that I would say, right, replace uh, Brooks at right guard. I would say, go ahead and roll up Big V. But he got paid, and I would never pay him that, <laughs> even to be a backup. But Matt Pryor fits the mold of what they want in guard. Look, Stefan Wisniewski was never the plan at left guard for the Eagles during that Super Bowl run. They wanted Say Omalu to claim that job. He just struggled a little bit. Transition to the NFL, it wasn't happening. But they wanted Say Omalu to be the left guard, and they gave him every opportunity. They even forced him into the lineup when... A lot of us back then thought that was a head scratcher. But look at his size. Look how the Eagles, the first one of the first moves they made during the Doug Peterson era, get out, go out and sign a bro- grueling, huge body right guard in Brandon Brooks. And look how they go into that draft, get a huge, huge polarizing figure in Isaac Sayamalu to eventually be their left guard. Who knows if he's going to be the center of the future. I don't, I'm not convinced anymore that he will be. I think he's cemented himself as the team's left guard. But they favor those those kind of guys. and You have to think that's a Jeff Stoutland thing. Maybe that's that's what Jeff Stoutland wants. Because Jeff Stoutland has all to say. And he's developed guys like Big V. He's developed Say Omalu. Developed Lane Johnson. Turned Jason Kelsey's career quite right around. Why are we not going to give that caliber of offensive lineman, who arguably is the best in the league, a chance to develop a player who I thought, when he unexpectedly had to go in last year when Brandon Brooks went down, played favorably well. And he fits the mold that they want. He's a polarizing figure. He could play offensive tackle with his size. But I thought he played good at guard last year. I thought that well enough to give him a chance. Nothing, Nothing that excites you. Nothing that would jump off the back because it was only, again, 79 snaps before the, uh, the wild card game. He didn't give up a sack. He didn't have one quarterback hit. Only had one penalty. And he saw some snap. He saw one snap against Minnesota week six. Then he played 42 against the Seahawks week 12. Played a little bit with the Giants. And then, obviously, Brandon Brooks goes down that game. Week 14. Excuse me, week 17, week 17. He played a little bit of week 14 with one, one snap against the Giants originally in the week 14. Week 17 is when he goes in for 35 snaps to replace Brandon Brooks. And he played well. He didn't give a, pen, a penalty or anything. Only one hurry. That was it. It's just going to be interesting to see how they, how they if he's ready to, to step in and be the starter. I think that's what a lot of people are worried about at this point. But again, 6'7", 338. 
That's the type of figure that Jeff Salton seems to favor. So why not just see if he can do it? And not only that, let's just say, for everybody that wants to argue the cap next year, this is Brandon. I, I love Brandon Brooks to death. And if anything, this plays into the Eagles' advantage if they want to. I don't want to say the injury plays at their advantage. They need Brandon Brooks this year. It'd be much better to, they'd be a much better football team with Brandon Brooks on the field, obviously. But if they want to restructure his contract, if they want him to take a pay cut, if they want to just go ahead and redo the deal like they did with something similar to like Rodney McLeod, just give him like a one year deal, prove it, come back, and then we'll reward you with another deal again. They could do so. They'll save two million dollars to get him off his current contract off the books. According to OverCap.com. I got all my numbers that we're going to talk about for the cap from OverTheCap.com. So all projections right now because we also don't know what the cap is going to look like in 2021. But I got to go with what I got right now and that's what I got. But yeah, so I'm, I'm completely on board with give, giving Matt Pryor the shot to do it. You're playing next to Jason Kelsey, who's arguably the best center in the game. Easily top three, at, obviously. Top two. Because Rodney Hudson's uh, someone that you they would probably anyone would argue with, but he's obviously top two. Wayne Johnson, I would say, is the best right tackle in the league. He's arguably top two with Mitchell Schwartz from the Chiefs. Matt Pryor's in a good situation. Gets a whole entire offseason to prepare for this position. Plays against, I mean, plays next to two strong fundamental pieces on this offensive line. I might have more faith in Matt Pryor stepping up. And replacing Brandon Brooks than I am Andre Dillard replacing Jason Peters. Because the left side of the line is obviously weaker. Left tackle is a much tougher position than right guard. And there might be confidence issues there because the Eagles kind of, you know, moved him all around last year. He failed at right tackle. He knew the coaches had to use him. Well, it looks like a mess already right there. I'm just hoping he can get out of it. Now... When I said that, so that's why I think that's exactly why I think Matt Pryor should get the shot. And not only that, the Eagles have like no money to use right now, barely any. They can make money to sign a free agent to compete with him, of course. And I expect them to. They take their off. They take the trenches way more seriously than most teams in the NFL. So I don't. I, I expect them to bring in another guard. I don't expect them to hand the reins to Matt Pryor. I don't expect them to think that Jack. Driscoll on a rookie year during this pandemic in, su- in such a complex offensive line that really runs the whole entire offense to come in and replace Brandon Brooks as a rookie. I expect them to have a free agent. But given everything that Pryor has shown, and again, I know a lot of people are going to say, come on, he's barely showed anything. But given what he's barely shown, given his size, given his development, I give it a shot. I completely give it a shot. If it doesn't work out, okay, go ahead and free agency. Get someone on a cheap one-year deal that has to prove themselves so they can get a next contract next year because I think either the Eagles go ahead with Brandon Brooks. Best, best case scenario, they go with Brandon Brooks or Matt Pryor proves to be what they need at right guard and he replaces Brooks. This is the best case scenario for the Eagles. Or they get a one-year rental and Josh Klein former offensive guard of the Patriots and Titans, almost traded to the Eagles during this time with the Patriots with the Eric Rowe trade. He was included in that last-minute pull, so the Eagles, there's some interest there because Jeff Stalin's still around, Doug Peterson's still around. That was their trade. Or you get Larry Warford, who just got replaced by a first-round pick. And I honestly, I think a lot of people know his accolades. He just came off a of Pro Bowl and everything, but he played... He declined a little bit last year. So now he can get the one-year prove-it deal in an offensive line that really doesn't need him to be the best player at all. I mean, might need him to be the fourth best player. And then he can get a new contract because he's going to look good. So that's a perfect situation. The Eagles is a perfect situation for Larry Warford for sure. I just The money is what the issue is. And there is there is interest around the league. I know the Bengals are really heavy in on him. So if it's a bidding war, the Eagles aren't going to get in on that. So you go ahead and get Josh Klein. Just say Josh Klein. Compete with Matt Pryor. I'm fine. See how it goes. If anybody, if there's anyone to trust with this offensive line, if there's anyone to trust developing someone on the line this offensive line, it's just Stoutland. And I trust him with Andre Dillard as well. 
I just think left tackle is a really tough position. You have a durability issue quarterback at Carson Wentz. You need him to stay upright and protect his blind side. I think Jason Peters can do a better job in 2020 than Andre Dillard can. But I believe in Andre Dillard no matter what. I think Andre Dillard is the future left tackle of this team. I wouldn't even move him in your guard. I wouldn't want to mess with his development any more than you already have. I wouldn't want to mess with his confidence more than you already have. So yes, I am fully on the go with the Matt Pryor. A guy you drafted. You have him on a rookie deal. You have an offensive line coach who's developed two key starters along your offensive line in, say, Mabo and Lane Johnson, who has made Jason Kelsey a way better pro than he was prior to Doug Peterson entering. I know Stalin was on ship staff as well, but we all thought in 2016 they were going to replace Kelsey. And now he's arguably the second best center in the league. So you have to give Salvin his credit for that as well. Brooks was a free agent signing that was a great starter in Houston, but not thought of what he is now. Yes, I trust Jeff Salvin with this. Now, this turns me into the Joe Tooney. I get the hype around Joe Tooney. I mean, he's a franchise tag player, but you just cannot afford him. Like, everybody knows what the Eagles cap situation is looking at next year, and I did my best homework that I can do on it right now because, we just, again, we don't know what the 2021 number is going to be thanks to this pandemic. So, you can yet you can move around money now. You can get down to that 53, 54, 55, whatever you need to get to, whatever it is now, roster, and get the money for this year to pay Drew Tooney on the franchise tag, I believe. But you can't pay him past next year. And again, the Eagles might just need to rent on a right guard anyways. But the compensation you have to give up is not worth it. The Patriots clearly like Joe Tooney. Enough to franchise tag him. In an offseason where they saw Tom Brady leave them, where they could have went ahead and just completely rebuild and trade Gilmore and trade Tooney and all the other good starters on that team to get draft picks and build towards the future, they decided to keep those guys for a reason. I think they wanted to see what they have in their current team, their number one defense. Hopefully Stidham pans out for them is what they're hoping. Gives them quality type quarterback play, maybe like along the same lines as Matt Castle did, and win with their number one defense. And now if you get to the trade deadline and that's not what it's looking like, then I can see when the Patriots are fine, okay, We'll move Joe Tooney. I just don't see it happening now. There's just so much unknown going into the season that I know Albert Breer was the one who brought this rumor. And again, I would not put it past the Eagles to search for options along the offensive line that are of that caliber to replace Brandon Brooks because of how serious they take their line play. I just don't see it happening. And this is exactly why I don't see the Jamal Adams trade happening either. And I'll get into that in a second. Money is definitely the issue. Compensation is also the issue. But when you have a young player like Matt Pryor, you have a Jason Kelsey who is the most important player on your offensive line. You have Lane Johnson who we all know is an all-pro, top two, undisputedly right tackle. You might be okay with Matt Pryor and a street free agent like Josh Klein or Larry Warford. You don't have to make this huge move, this huge splash with Joe Tooney. Now, again, yes, he could be, he could end up being your future right guard of the team, but again, you're in 50 million, you're negative 50 million next year for cap, and it's looking rough. And I'll get into how they're going to have to make money move around, but it's, it's I, I could not get to the 50 million number. And I'm sure Howie Roseman can. I get, I got up to 32.9 million. I'm sure Howie Roseman, the great finance, I, I, I don't doubt him would. Making that whole situation better. I'm sure he'll restructure Carson once somehow. I'm sure he'll restructure Fletcher Cox's deal somehow. I'm, Ertz maybe. I, I'm sure Howie Roseman will fix that. I'm not worried about the cap next year. I'm just telling you why acquiring players like a Joe Tooney, like a Jamal Adams, is really difficult. Because we have to finally for one year consider the cap. And consider the fact that this, the, the, the tides that this team is turning. They're going to have to replace their older veterans that they won the Super Bowl with. Years ago now. And continue the tradition of building up, developing, and drafting players that they're trying to do. I do think they're all in on 2020. I think they have the key veterans that they need on this team to be in all in on 2020. 
But next season, there there's going to be some changes. They're going to have a couple key vets still. Fletcher Cox is not going anywhere. I don't think Darius Slay is going anywhere next year. Brennan Graham's not going anywhere, I don't believe either. But they are looking at a lot of changes. And they're going to need the resources that they can make. But most importantly, the draft picks to help replace those players, those holes on the team. So Joe Tooney doesn't add up. Especially in an an offensive line starved league where any team that needs a right guard. Any guard, because I think Joe Tooney could play either guard position. Would give up more than what the Eagles are willing to give up to get him. For sure. And extend him to that long-term deal. And may have the more means to do so. The Patriots themselves next year have not. They're projected right now. Which obviously this will change. But are projected right now to have $94 million in cap space. They can easily extend Joe Tooney. Especially if they want to bring in this young quarterback. Like a Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance. Jimmy Newman's, whoever of the world's. They're going to need to protect them, so I would, especially on a rookie contract, you could afford to pay a guard for four years at top money. So there's why I'm just out on the Joe Tooney thing. Don't think it's possible, but if the Patriots are serious about getting compensation and the Eagles are willing to meet the asking price, which again, like I said, I know I've sounded a little hypocritical, but like I said, I would not put it past them because of how serious they take the offense. I would, I would say trading for Joe Tooney, is a more likely scenario than trading for Jamal Adams. I'm going to tell you why right now because I'm going to get into it. So, the Eagles going into this 2021 20, offseason, like we all know, we're all afraid of the cap. We're all terrified because of where it's looking at right now. I get it. But they go into this 2021 offseason, negative 50. So, you're going to have to look at some players they're going to have to get rid of. But let's talk about some players that they also have to might replace. I'll get into the money last. But here's some players that they might have to replace. Jason Kelsey, let's just say he retires because it's we're, we worried about it heavily this past offseason. Let's just say he goes ahead and does it. He retires. He's done. He's out. I don't think they save any money with him retiring. I really should have some more information on that because if they were to cut him, it's negative $1 million. So they'll own his rights until his contract's up, which is 2024. They have an option in 2022. Uh I'm not sure how he affect how he what savings that he gets with retirement. I looked everywhere, I can't get it. But I just know that there if he was if they were to cut him, it's negative one million. So no savings from Jason Kelsey that I can find. So now you have to replace your starting center, which is a huge important part for this offense. Then you look at right guard. You might decide Brandon Brooks getting older coming off this injury. Saving the two million might have to be the th- what we consider doing right now, and letting him go. So now, if Matt Pryor didn't step up, if you don't have a clear picture at right guard, you have to now replace your center and your right guard. That's two starters. Avante Maddox and Sidney Jones don't pan out at cornerback two next year. I mean, in twenty twenty. So now you have to replace your quarterback. You have to get a cornerback two to put next to Slay in this passing league when your division has Terry McLaurin. Sterling Shepard, Golden Tate, Darius Slayton, C.D. Lamb, Amari, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, that you have to play for six times in a season. You need to get that cornerback too. That's three starters on offense. Derek Barnett, you save a noticeable amount of money getting rid of him. And if he proves to be, again, like an average starter, they might decide that. That $10 million that they can get for him in savings is worth it. Get rid of him. Okay. That's four starters now you have to replace. Alshon Jeffrey, gone next year no matter what. This is a definite. You don't have a next caliber wide receiver. J.J. Arcega Whiteside doesn't look good in year two. That's five players you need to replace now. Deshaun Jackson definitely gone too. I think it's his last season in Philadelphia. Barring... A, Barring a 1K season where you can clearly tell that he had something left in the tank. I don't see it happening. I think he plays like 12 games max. He's going to have that yearly injury or something. I just hope it's not as dire as last time. Because again, he is their best wide receiver on the team currently by far, for sure. 
I don't want to say by far, but he is the best team wide receiver for sure. Yes. But he's getting older. I they save five million, get rid of him. I'm going to just say right now, it's probably his last seasons on the team. So it's six players you have to get uh replaced and a huge speed threat. Which obviously Jalen Rager is your future wide uh your Z wide receiver. But if he looks if he struggles in this rookie year and he he's your the guy that you're hoping replaces Josh Sean Jackson, that's a that's a huge one unknown if he struggles in his rookie year going into the twenty twenty one season if this is what the scenario plans out. But I don't I don't foresee that happen. I have a lot of faith in Jalen Rager, as all you know. Malik Jackson. Definitely gone. No matter what. I don't see what anything that, that could have older coming off season ending injury at the beginning of the season. Pandemic slows down probably his workout regime or something. I know he's been training with Fletcher Cox, but I just don't see how you keep him on the team pass this year still. But you still need that third defensive tackle. You still need for that for Jim Schwartz's defense. You need interior defensive tackle that still. So I'm going to say that's seven players now yet to replace. Let's get into one more. That's potential. Because I know a lot of people talk about it a lot and people hate it. I hate it too because he's such a great and elite player for the team. But you're talking extension with Zach Ertz in the middle of the season, twenty uh, last season, and he turned it down. So clearly he wants he's thinking money right now, which he deserves. Top three tight end by far for sure in the NFL. Kittle, Kelsey, Ertz is my top three. You can argue whatever you want. I don't care. Ertz is definitely top three, though, and I agree with you. So at least we can all agree on that. If he wants to get paid top tight end money, I don't know if the Eagles will do it. I think the Eagles would expect a little help from him to continue the winning tradition and show him, hey, you know, we won the Super Bowl in Lombardi. I know you want to get paid this top money because, you again, you turned down this extension in twenty during the season. So clearly you weren't liking what you were seeing there. But we need to continue building this winner. We need to continue to win. We need to get a ring with Carson Wentz. We want you on board for that. He might not. He might want to get paid. He deserves to get paid. I completely understand. Now, they don't get much cap savings from him being gone. It's about $4 million if they get rid of him. But maybe they decide, hey, we were heavily eyeing tight ends in the 2020 NFL Draft as Mike K from NJ.com has reported. He reported uh, Stephen Sullivan from LSU, uh, who the Seahawks ended up getting, and now they're moving to wide receiver. Uh, Mike K has said the Eagles were heavily interested on him in the seventh round, uh, as he hinted for a couple players uh, during episode nine of Eagles Brawl when he came on the show. So they were heavily looking at tight ends. Zach Gertz turns down that section during the season. Maybe they decide... Goddard long term on lesser money and then going into the draft and getting another tight end because of how much we love 12 personnel. Or maybe we shy away and go more 11 and let Goddard be the feature tight end on a long term deal with lesser money. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. I can't imagine they get rid of Zach Gertz, but with what I just said, you have to now think about it. You have to remember. And again, Bleeding Green Nation was the first that reported this. Zach Gertz turned down that. Extension that was offered during late during late into the 2019 season. So clearly, he did not like what the Eagles were offering. The Eagles were heavily eyeing tight ends in the 2020 NFL Draft. Goddard's deal is coming up. You have to make a decision at tight end at some point. Maybe they decide to pay Goddard long term. Because you're going to be paying, if you're paying Goddard, you're probably paying him a top tight, 10 tight end contract. Because he'll get that in free agency easily for sure. Are you going to pay two tight ends in the top 10 range? Because you're paying Ertz top three money and then you're paying Goddard top 10 money. You're going to pay that for two tight ends. I know the Eagles are one of the heavily run 12 personnel teams. I can expect them to continue that. But I don't know if they would do that with Ertz, especially aging. It'll be interesting to see for sure. But now. Say that they end up doing that next offseason, that Zach Ertz is one of the tough decisions. That's 
eight players you have to replace because, again, I think you need to get a, a tight end behind Goddard. Because I, I fully expect them not to shy away from 12 personnel. I don't think Doug Peterson hates it. That's a lot. That's eight players. That's eight key players on your team. Not to mention whoever else you have to replace because Jalen Mills and, and Will Parks aren't on long-term deals. Maybe they don't work out and they have to replace them in the secondary now. Maybe Nikel Roby Coleman doesn't resign, so now your nickel corner is either going to be Maddox or who knows. Maybe McLeod looks even worse than he did last year and you decide you have to move on from him, so now you need a free safety. Your linebacking core, who knows with that position. I don't think the Eagles care that much, though, but who knows. Derek Barnett doesn't doesn't improve. Now you need another defensive end. You're hoping maybe Jannard Avery <laughs> becomes the guy. Uh, not Josh Sweat. I don't think Josh Sweat's a starter, as we mentioned in the show. Great pass rusher, but I don't think he's a three-down starter. They're going to need their draft picks. Free agency is not going to answer most of those questions. I want to answer maybe one or two, like it usually does. There's no way you can make you can make sense of trading what it would take to get Jamal Adams, especially for a team that just showed you we had a quality starting safety box safety that does Jamal Adams does everything that Malcolm Jenkins does as a higher level, but again he does everything that Malcolm Jenkins does. The Eagles said we don't want to pay the quality starter that Malcolm Jenkins is. Again, you can argue that his play was declining. I I would agree, but still they didn't want to pay. The level that it took to keep a player of Malcolm Jenkins caliber at that position that Jamal Adams is at. They decided to go with quantity and spread out all that money between Slay, Rebby Coleman, Mills, and Parks if you look at their cap numbers in 2020. So why would they go ahead and then get Jamal Adams, pay him, because he would he's going, when he's, once he signs his new deal, he's going to be the, the highest paid safety in the NFL. Give up all these picks for him. And then be set at a position that they're not, they don't seem too focused on. They're, they're way more focused on that. We already know what the Eagles feel about their defense. It's all, it's built through the defensive line. They've invested money in Javon Hargrave, good money in Javon Hargrave. They invested good money in Malik Jackson. They have good money invested in Fletcher Cox. They have good money invested in Brandon Graham. They have good money invested in Darius Slay finally because they decided they finally need to get that premier cornerback one and pay him. I don't see them investing any top money anywhere else on the defense besides the places that I named. Cornerback one and defensive line. If they have to replace Barnett, they're going to very aggressively with maybe the likes of Yannick Nagakwe. Maybe they draft, maybe they trade one up in the draft and draft one high. I'm not sure, but I think if they have to replace Barnett, from what history has shown, they'll make it work and they will with a very good player because nobody saw us saw the Eagles signing Javon Hargrave. Nobody saw them getting Malik Jackson the year prior. Nobody saw them making that crazy trade for teaming journey again. They care about the defensive line. They signed Chris Long in free agency. They they traded for Michael Bennett. They drafted Derek Barnett in the top 15. They love Brandon Graham. They're built through the defensive line. That's going to continue. I don't see them investing. They, I, I, that's, my point is, I see them investing... When it comes time to invest, I see them investing in a defensive end rather than a safety, like Jamal Adams. I think if Yannick's situation deteriorates during the season, the Jaguars decide that they have to move on from him like they did with Jalen Ramsey. I expect the Eagles to be more on that. I don't see it happening with Jamal Adams. I have to address it because everybody talks about it. I understand. Jamal Adams, the talent makes sense. The I, I fully would endorse and be happy if they got him for sure. I believe that they undervalued the safety position and I think it will bite them in the ass this season. So yes, Jamal Adams, the talent makes sense. The compensation with the way the Eagles look with the 2021 cap. I know people don't think it take it seriously. I know some fans on Twitter think how he's going to get him out, get us out of this no matter what. I expect him to get us out of this. I just don't expect him to be active in free agency doing so. And if he is, and if he is active, it's going to be the player that replaces Derek Barnett. Obviously, you're hoping that Derek Barnett comes in and has a great year next year so that you can extend him and keep your homegrown talent. 
But if they have to replace him, I expect them to be more vigorous and aggressive doing so with that position than I would at safety with Jamal Adams. I don't see it happening. Jim Schwartz loves Jalen Mills. I'm sure they're going to give him every opportunity and then some to be that safety that they want, that they had in Malcolm Jenkins. Maybe, if not Mills, Will Parks, who is also familiar with that skill set. They are not, I just don't see it. I do not see them investing heavy money into the safety position, especially given all the obstacles that are in their way. Look, you can cut Barnett, you save $10 million. You can cut Brooks, you can save $2 million. You can cut Alshon, you save $7.9 million. You cut Deshaun, you save $5 million. You cut Malik, you save $1 million. I was generous there. You save pretty much nine hundred k with him. I'll, I'll just round it up to a million with, with what the number was. If they get rid of Marquise Goodwin and he doesn't make the team this year, they save $4 million doing so. If he does make the team and they go into the next offseason and go him, they save $7 million. So this is all numbers according to over the cap. That gets them to $32.9 million in savings. Again, they are at negative 50 under the cap. A lot of restructures are going to have to be done. A lot of tough decisions are going to have to be done. They're going to have to, it looks like they're going to have to replace at least six players. Because I think Kelsey might retire. That's a definite, immediate priority need that you would put a, the Eagles would prioritize center over safety. They would prioritize right guard over safety. Maybe. I don't want to, okay. They would definitely, they would definitely prioritize center over safety. They may prioritize wide receiver over safety. They could prioritize tight end over safety, but they definitely would prioritize center over safety. That's the only one I could say that they definitely would. I just don't see it happening with Jamal Adams. There's no way that's going to happen, in my opinion. They have way too many obstacles in their way. I think they're going to lean heavily on the draft. How he's going to pull a rabbit out of his hat, get enough cap space to sign that one or two free agents like he usually does. And that's it. I don't see Jamal Adams being it. I don't see Joe Tooney being it. If they do make this crazy move, this crazy eye-opening move, it might be mid-season for Yannick. If the Jaguars continue to deteriorate, they have to put Kayvon Chase in, in more because he's looking good in a limited role. Their defensive NL LSU, they just drafted the 20th overall pick. Josh Allen, obviously they can't take off the field. Top 10 pick. They decide the draft picks, especially when they want to go ahead and get the quarterback matter now. So they trade Yannick midseason. I can see the Eagles being in on that. Or if they go into the next offseason and they play the game of tag again or Yannick hits free agency, I could see the Eagles being in on him for sure. That's the big move I see happening. Anything else? I don't. So, again, I'll end it with, the show with just saying Jamal Adams, the talent makes sense for sure would be a great addition to the Eagles defense. Something that might even put them over the top of being one of the top tier NFC teams, but the compensation does not make sense. Joe Tooney also does not make sense. I do not see the Eagles giving up that much to get him. Other teams would be way more willing to give up what more than what the Eagles would for a solid guard if they have to get in, bring in somebody, I would bring in a guy that would compete with Matt Pryor, like a Josh Klein or Larry Warford. I wouldn't go out and trade for a guy like Joe Tooney. And the impact on Brandon Brooks, we need to talk about it more. One of the best premier guards in the NFL. It is going to be felt. You just hope at this time when the Eagles have so much. Again, and then also, Brandon Brooks got injured in January against the Saints in that playoff game. And was ready and returned, and again, that was Achilles injury, and was ready in September, week one, when he was supposed to be out for longer. So that's an eight-month period. Maybe, especially with the pandemic, if it pushes the season back, or even if it doesn't, maybe Brady Brooks is, is ready by the time the Eagles get into week 17 and have to go into the playoffs. I wouldn't doubt that guy's the boat to get back on the football field. So maybe they feel, okay, we can get by with Matt Pryor as we can. And Brandon Brooks will be back in time for the playoffs when, the, when the, it really matters the most. Again, I know Rust and everything, but who who knows? Maybe he's ready by December. We'll see. Who knows? But 
Thank you guys for tuning in. Again, Eagles Brawl, five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts are greatly appreciated. If you can, or any reviews or any ratings you want to give, that's absolutely fine as well. Leave some questions in the reviews if you would like that you can get answered on air. Again, we have Brandon Thorne on for the next episode as we talk about the offensive line. We talk about Javon Hargrave edition because, again, I feel like it's their most flown under the radar best offseason edition. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you have you guys have a great weekend.